If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter five is um, really the word that God has laid upon my heart to share with you. And I, I need your prayers. I need your prayers big time, big time prayers. And the reason I need your prayers is because I'm going through a season where God is stretching my faith. And the season I'm going through right now is I'm trying to teach not one, but two twin daughters who just turned 15 how to drive. And it's scary. It's scary. Because just when I get over the PSD of, of dealing with one driver, the other one says, now it's my turn, dad. And now I got to jump in and deal with the trauma and the fear of dealing with another 15 year old who's learning how to drive. And it's been crazy in our house. And, and what I've learned is until you really understand the rhythm of driving, you don't want to drive with someone who's just learning how to drive because there's basically two things that happen. You go very, very fast, quickly, that scares you. And then you stop very, very quickly, which gives you whiplash. It's just stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. So constantly I'm doing this. And, and literally I got done, my shoulder hurt. Because of all the stopping and going, stopping and going, stopping and going, stopping and going, stopping and going. And I'm teaching them driving. And isn't it incredible, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, that when you're in the middle of it, if you just open your eyes and begin to listen and begin to hear and live with an awareness that God will speak to you, even when you're teaching your twin 15 year olds how to drive. And so my girls are going, stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. And so it's like this. And God began to speak something. He said, you better pray because your life might end today. And so I'm like, okay, God, I'm praying. But then he also said, James, a lot of time, this is how you live your life. I want to accelerate. I want to go. I'm a driven person. So I want to do, do, do. And I run very fast. I run fast. And then I get so worn out and so tired that I just stop. And I just come to an abrupt stop. And I never really rest because what ends up happening is I'm just going and stopping, going and stopping. And what I want to talk about both this week and next week, it's a two part series. And so you can't miss next week. So you're already here at our first part. So you just better be prepared to come next week, no matter what's on your plan. But we're going to talk about how can we really begin to stop, find rest. And then what does it really look like to go to work? And I want us to find a rhythm between these two, because I think we have really messed it up to the point that we don't understand what it's like to live in a rhythm of rest and a rhythm of work. And so in Deuteronomy chapter five, God is going to lay down this principle of rest and he gathers his people together and they are about to enter into the promised land. And he speaks to this tension, this desire within us to go, 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 and then just stop, but never experiencing real rest. So Deuteronomy chapter five, verse 12, he speaks to his people, gathers them together. And he says, I want you to observe the Sabbath day, observe the Sabbath day don't just kind of go through it, but I want you to actually observe it. I want you to be intentional in taking rest and I want you to keep it holy. The word holy, if you have your Bible, circle it, it means set apart. It has a sacred function. And so what God is doing is he's saying there's a sacredness to your time that you will miss it, that there's a divine intentionality that God has with all your days, that if you're not careful, you can fill your days with busyness that you'll miss the divine opportunities and the divine purpose that God has for the time he's given you. Time is limited. And so he says in this limited time, I want you to take it and I want you to begin to rest, keep it holy, sacred as unto the Lord, your God who has commanded you. And so God begins to speak to a people and he says, what I want you to do is I want you to learn how to rest. And this word Sabbath, Sabot, it, it actually means, it's a noun, it means at one time just to cease to rest. But what happens throughout the Bible is they've taken this word, this noun, and they have actually made it into a verb. And it means to cease, to celebrate rest. So God says, I want you to rest. I created you with limits. I created you a limit to go and a limit to stop. I've created you with the limits. And in these limits, I want you to take some time and really begin just to rest. Now, through Christ Jesus, we realize this isn't just a command that we have to do in order to earn salvation. So when we talk about the Sabbath, our principle is we look through the lens of the gospel and we interpret the Old Testament through the New Testament lens of what Christ did for us on the cross. 
And the scripture says that Jesus fulfilled the law. So he fulfilled all the religious requirements for the Sabbath. So we don't obey the Sabbath in order to earn forgiveness. We don't obey the Sabbath to earn God's love. Even Paul says, there's no special day. If you kind of worship on this day and say, hey, this is Saturday, this is Sabbath. I'm doing it right. Everybody else doing wrong. The apostle Paul says, no, that's wrong. Through Christ Jesus, all days are sacred. All days can be set apart. And so he's not given us this command He's given us actually an invitation that we have an invitation really to begin to rest a regular rhythm of rest. And here's why it's important. If I was to stop you two years ago and say, Hey, life is busy. Everybody would say, you're right. It's busy. It's busy. It's busy, 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 busy. And here's what everybody would say. You know what I need? I just need everything to stop. If I could just go and stay home for a season and not do anything, if the whole world would just shut down and I could have a little break, then I wouldn't be as busy as I am now. And that would give me rest. And so what happened? We went through a pandemic. Everything shut down. We were forced to stay home. We couldn't leave. And yet, did it give us rest? There's something your soul aches for more than just time off. There's something within you that that wants, that craves something soul-wise that's beyond just kind of kicking back and letting time pass. There's a reason why you can go on vacation and still not experience rest. You can take time off and still not have rest. You can stay at home and still not have rest. So the rest we're talking about is not just staying home and doing nothing or just kind of just saying, okay, I quit and abandoning everything. That's not the rest we're talking about. When the Bible talks about a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath rest is a soul rest that wants to restore both physically and emotionally and physically who you are. Because when God looks at you, he doesn't divide you. He looks at you as a person that you have a physical reality, you have a spiritual reality, you have emotional reality, you have a, relig- a, a relational reality. And he looks at you as a complete human. And in that, he says, you need to rest in every capacity of who you are. And so when the Bible talks about a rest, the Sabbath rest, it's rest that begins to restore us really to the heart level. In the weariness, in the hurt, in the craziness of life, the Sabbath rest restores. It brings back to life those things that are hurting. The Sabbath replenishes. It actually begins to take the emptiness that is in us, the things that we deplete ourselves out because we're constantly giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. And you can give and give and give till there's really nothing left to give. And that's why what the Sabbath does, this, there's a rhythm of rest, allows us to replenish what we keep pouring out. And it begins to refocus your life on what is essential, what is eternal, what really matters, what you need to do. And so God says, I want you to understand. I want you to rest. And there's a difference. There's a difference at night if I just go and and my iPhone is on the verge of dying, if I just turn it off and put it on the stand. It's resting, but it's not ready for the next day. But if I take that same iPhone, turn it off and I plug it in and I recharge it, there's a difference, isn't it? Now it's ready to go to the next day. What ends up happening is you go and go and go and you think all I need to do is just turn off. And so you turn off your mind, your heart, your emotions, your physical realities, your relationships, and just say, I need me time. And you close yourself off thinking this will give you rest, but you're not replenishing. You're not refreshing. What you're doing is you're just turning yourself off. You're not recharging to give you the very next thing to take you into the next season of your life. So God says, for my people, I'm giving them an invitation to find real soul rest. So how do we do that? Look at verse 13. So six days shall you labor and do all your work. Now we're going to talk about this in depth next week, because I believe it's the one thing that we've lost. We're afraid to work. And the reason we're afraid to work and the reason that work burns us out so much is we've forgotten why God created work in the first place. And just FYI, it's not for a paycheck. If you work for a paycheck, it will burn you out. And so he says, God says, I want you to take six days and six days and I want you to work, run hard, be driven, succeed. God has no problem with you succeeding. He wants people who are business entrepreneurs. He wants you to be incredible students. He wants all those things. God says, go six days, run hard, accomplish great things. But verse 14, but 
On the seventh day is a Sabbath of time of rest, a celebration of rest. And notice it's to the Lord. So it has a divine purpose. And so God says, it's taking time where you begin to cease so you can begin to take intentional time to push in, to actually connect with God, enjoy God. It's regularly, intentionally engaging with God one day out of the week where you rest in him, enjoy him, connect with him. This is the pattern, God says. I want you to take this and realize it's a Sabbath unto the Lord, not unto you. I need me time. No, 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 no. The Sabbath that says, God, I need you to refresh me. I need you to restore me. So how do we do that? He says, let me tell you, because I know right now you're thinking, I can't, I can't, I can't. And he says, on it, you shall not do any work. Well, well what about, and we always come up with loopholes, don't we? Well, tell me what it really means. And God says, let, let me just be very clear. Neither you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male, or your female servant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your town so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. So what's God's heart? God's heart is we find rest. It's passion. And so he looks at a group of people, and this is what so amazes me. He looks at a group of people who have just gotten out of slavery. 400 years, they've been slaves. Now they've been living in the wilderness. Every day they have to pack up their stuff, move to a different location. They have to find water and find food that day. So this is a hand to mouth. There is no Publix. There is no, hey, Amazon Prime, I need something right now. There is no storing up stuff. There is no Walmart delivery system heading into the desert. There's none of that. So these are people who are going, if I don't work, I don't eat. You want to talk about pressure. This is a hand to mouth culture. And God says, I want you to take one of those days and rest. Rest, rest. And in their mind, they're going, we can't do this. This is insane. This is going to kill us. This is going to destroy us. And God says, I'm not giving this as a condition to enter in a relationship. I'm giving this as a condition for you to understand the fullness of the relationship I want to have with you. I want you to be the type of people who can rest. I want the world to know that if you're a follower of me, that if you are a, a son and daughter of the living God, people should know you as a person who has rest. So how? How, how do we do this? And why is it so hard? I, I spent the last kind of month as thinking about this message and how I was going to deliver it, just asking a simple question because I ask most people, how are you doing? And one of the things I hear over and over again is I'm tired. I feel worn out. I'm done. And so I go, well, why do you think it's so hard for us to rest? And here's my homework for you. If you, if you shut off everything else I say for the rest of the sermon, that's all right. Here's my homework I want you to do. I want you to ask yourself this question. Why is it so hard for me to rest? Not just stop, but rest. Why is it so hard? And what's fascinating is that Moses actually gives us some insight of why it's so difficult for us really to begin to rest. Because he makes this statement, verse 15, look what it says. Remember when you were slaves in Egypt? Re remember, the only way that you're going to be able to observe the Sabbath and dedicate it to me is you have to remember there was a time where you could not have the option to rest. You had to work. The reason you had to work is you had slave masters. You had taskmasters who had a whip in their hand. And if you stopped working, they would beat you into working. And Pharaoh had a big ego. And Pharaoh wanted to create these incredible monuments, but he didn't want to do the work. So he brought you in as slaves. And remember how he tortured you. Remember how he put fear in you. Remember why work and rest were never in play because work is all you knew. Rest wasn't even an option. Remember... And he wants them to remember, because I've learned something. You can be freed externally, but if your mind, you still think like a slave, you'll still live like a slave. If you still think you're a slave in your mind, you'll live like a slave in your life, even if no one has a bullwhip or a taskmaster over you. And the reason why we struggle to rest 
is because even though they've left Egypt is there's fear that still resides in their heart. And the reason why we struggle to rest is if we're honest, there's fear, fear. What's some of the fear we have that makes us struggle in resting? I think there's the fear of missing out, FOMO. We're afraid to miss out. We're afraid that if we take a little rest, if we take a little break, we're gonna miss out on some experience. We're gonna miss out on something that would allow us to go forward. It's the reason why parents make their kids max out their schedule. Well, Johnny has to be in baseball and then he has to go to this thing and they go to that thing. And oh, by the way, he has to get into this. And they plan out their whole entire schedule, pushing everything to the max on the kid. Why? I don't want him to miss out on an opportunity. And there's this deep fear, this deep, deep, deep fear within us that we just don't want to miss out. It's the single who says, well, I, I don't want to miss out on what it's like. How, how, why should I get married? Because if I get married, I'm just going to get bogged down and I'm going to miss out on all this fun. Why? How do I know he's Mr. Right? How do I know she's Miss Right? How do I know? How do I know? What if I haven't found them yet? And there's this fear. The whole reason we struggle the rest is there's this desire, this burn within us that goes, well, I just want to keep trying, keep finding. Maybe I haven't found it yet. It's a push within us to keep going strong. It's a fear of missing out. Missing out on an experience, missing out on a deal, missing out on going forward, missing out. And there's a real feel of fear in all of our hearts. We go, if I don't do this, I'm going to miss something. And if I miss it, I'll never be able to redeem it. And so when we're tired, we keep going. And it's the reason why even when we come home and we try to rest, Something hits us and we go, well, I can't rest. You know why? Mm. You know, they just put Ted Lasso season two up on Apple TV and that's a good show and I got to watch it and I'm just going to kind of binge through it all. And you know, they just put this on Netflix and now I got to watch it. And we just begin to binge watch shows because we're afraid we're going to miss something. The reason why we go on social media and allow the feed to keep feeding us because we're afraid we're going to miss something. Well, well, I don't want to miss what they did. And I, I, I don't want to do that. I mean, come on, I got to keep up on what everybody's doing and all their business because I got to know my business and their business. And I got to make sure I don't miss out. It's, it's a reason why we zombie shop. We just kind of flip through Amazon, flip through the things because we're just something is missing. We're going to occupy our time. Even when we're trying to rest. We can't rest because we go, what if I missed the deal? What if I miss it? And we're constantly getting beamed and teen on our phones and every electronics we have reminding us, you're about to miss it. You're about to miss it. And there's this real fear, right? There's real fear that I'm going to miss it. I signed up for a stupid Amazon treasure truck. And every day about 12 o'clock, it tings me, boop. And, and I don't care if I need it. I don't want to miss what they're about to sell me. And so I go, whoa, I got to get this. I got to get this. Why? There's this fear. We don't want to miss out on a good deal or something. We don't want to miss it. We struggle. There's a fear of missing out. There's the fear of falling short. There's a the fear we're going to let people down if we rest. Well, if I don't call them, if I don't go over there and do that, then I'm going to hurt them. And once they get mad, then I might destroy everything. And I, I don't want people to be mad at me. There's a fear that I'm going to miss out, that if I don't work hard enough, then somebody else might, might get the promotion and I'm going to fall short because I'm not going to be able to get the promotion that I so desperately want. I feel like I'm going to fall short and we tie so much of our identity up in our busyness. We don't want people to think we're lazy. And so we run hard and we run fast and we fill our time with things and our minds with things and we can't stop thinking because in our mind, we don't want to fall short. We always want to feel like we measure up and we don't want to fail because our identity is attached to what we do. And this is why we work so hard at times and think about things we, we, we should just turn our mind off, but we can't turn our mind off because we just can't think about what would happen. If we fall short, we don't want to disappoint people. We don't want to disappoint ourselves. We have to close that deal. We have to go forward on the very thing we're looking for. There's a fear, fear of falling short. There's also a fear of being real. Something happens when you get silent. 
you actually have to examine what's going on around you. And a lot of times we don't want to get still because we don't want to hear the voices around us. And so we blur up the noise a little louder because if the noise is loud, we don't have to listen to what we hear in our hearts and we don't have to listen to the complexities and the brokenness around us. And so instead of de dealing with the fractures in our relationships and our marriage, it's just easier to kind of skip it and fill our schedules with other things because, hey, it's just better to ignore it than it is to actually deal with it. And still, the, instead of deal with some of the deep things that are broken within us, it's easier just to hide it and never really talk about it and never really begin to bring it to God and process it with God because we're just going so fast that we just blur the noise because we don't want to be still and listen. That we're addicted to the noise. And the problem is, when you hide, God can never heal. And so until you actually begin to address it, God can't begin to really work healing in the middle of it. And so we just keep going because we're afraid of being real in what we'll hear when we get quiet. It's the reason why some of you cannot go to sleep unless you're drunk. Because if you lay in bed, your mind starts getting and starts moving. And you start asking questions. You start living past things and you begin to be filled with guilt and regret. And where God wants to enter in to bring restoration, you keep trying to numb because you have a fear of being real. And there's the fear of losing control. The fear that says, well, if I don't handle this, who's gonna handle it? If I don't deal with it, who's gonna deal with it? If I don't take care of this at work, who's gonna take care of it at work? If I don't deal with this at my house, who's gonna take care of it at my house? If I don't do this, you don't understand, I can't take one day off a week because I only got one day. And if I just take this one day and I don't do anything and I just kind of camp out and I just, my mind starts going, all the things that I still have to do. And I mean, who's going to take care of the yard? Who's going to take care of the grass? Who's going to take care of the relationship? Who's going to take care of those things? Who is going to take care of all the stuff? Who's going to go? I got to check that email. I got to check the email and I got to answer that text about work because if I don't, who will? And we're afraid that we're going to lose control because if we don't provide for us, if we don't fight for us, if we don't take care for us, if we don't handle it ourselves, who will handle it? And this is what God speaks to. Remember when you were forced to work? And you didn't work because you enjoyed it. You worked it because you were afraid. Remember when you were slaves? And into that, he speaks a word. He says, remember, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord, your God, he brought you out. Who redeemed you? The Lord, your God. And he brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm that God knew what was going on. He saw what was going on and he was the God who had compassion on you. God did what you could not do. God controlled the situation when you felt that there was no way that God could ever move. God stepped in and did the work you could not do. And he's reminding them, remember you were a slave, but remember how the mighty God with his outstretched arm and his mighty hand stepped in to rescue. Therefore, now he gives the back end of it. Therefore, just a reminder, the Lord, who is your God, you have the Lord as your God, the Lord who's ransomed you, redeemed you, saved you. He's the one who has instructed you. He's the one who's commanded you. He's the one who says, hey, it's all right to take one day and find rest. One day out of all the rest of the days, one day a week to rest. That God says, I'll take care of it. Trust me. I'll take care of it. Believe that I can do it. You see, the real issue of rest isn't work. It's fear. And the real issue isn't time. It's trust. And God's trying to get them and get us to, to redirect our lives, redirect our thinking. Where we begin to say, God, rest is not when I just stop. But rest is ultimately when I keep trusting. That rest is an inside job. 
it, it, it's not something that, hey, when everything falls into place and I can take time and I have time finally on my hands and I can just stay at home. No, we, we, we went through that. No, thank you, God, right? We need rest. We don't need time off. We don't need quarantine. We need rest. And so, God, I need some rest. So he speaks into it and he says, what I'm telling you is not, has nothing to do about time or any of those things. What it has to do is about truly trusting in my goodness and my grace and my power, my provision. I'm the God who provided for you. I'm the God who rescued you. I'm the God who went in and did what you could not do. I'm the God who cares. I'm the God who sees. I'm the God who knows. And I want you to know, I will take care of you. Do you trust me? And it's only when you settle that you can rest because resting in God frees you to rest. This is how your soul replenishes itself. This is how your life begins to replenish itself. This is when you're empty, you begin to get filled. Do you realize that God, I need to rest in you. It's accepting my limitations, accepting that I, I don't control everything. It's accepting the fact that the world doesn't need me. And that's hard to admit, isn't it? But God, I need you. And God, you provided for me and you protected me and you'll sustain me. And so I can rest. God, I know I got all these things that I'm worried about and I'm anxious about and I'm thinking about and I want to handle and I want to control and I want to do that's going to push me to drive, to go further and the ambition will kick in that I can handle it. But God, I want you to know one day I'm reminding myself, this is a Sabbath unto you, Lord. I'm setting it apart. It has a divine purpose and that's purpose is to teach me to truly begin the rest. The only time you'll experience a rhythm of rest is if you truly trust in the goodness of God. That was his point. You can rest because I'm your God and I'm the God who redeemed you and rescued you. So, so what does that look like? My challenge for you is to dedicate one day, just a day to a time of rest, one day to a time of rest. And, and I tell you in my life, how I found this out. Shane and I were newly married and we just got married and I started in my graduate studies. And so I was going to school full time, but I realized that if I was a husband, I also had to provide because I couldn't live at home with my wife. I actually had to go to school with my wife and we had to provide for ourselves. That was a big shock. So if, if I didn't pay the electric bill, we wouldn't have electricity. If I didn't pay for the rent, it wouldn't happen. We wouldn't have a place to stay. And so I had this pressure of, okay, I have, to, I have to, first of all, I have to deal with my marriage. I have to deal with the reality of the marriage around me. I have to make sure that I work hard at my school because I don't want to fail. But it also means that I have to keep a full-time job in order to be able to pay for all this. And so I'm full-time in a new relationship, new marriage, full-time as a student in master level classes, graduate school, and at the same time, full-time working in order to pay for all the things else that are going on in my life. I was exhausted. And I was kept spinning my wheels and spinning my wheels and it kept going faster. And I kept going, God, I just don't have enough time. I'm worn out. I'm tired. I'm overwhelmed. I can't do this. God, I'm struggling. And one of my spiritual mentors, I was sharing with him and he said, you know what you need to do? You need to rest. And I said, thank you, Captain Obvious. I know I need to rest. How? He says, I want to challenge you to take one day off and dedicated to the Lord to rest. And I said, God, I can't do that. I'm trying to work full time. I'm trying to help handle my marriage full time. And I'm trying to deal with all of the other stuff I'm dealing with. I can't do that. And he challenged me. He said, I want you to just to try the rhythm of rest in the Sabbath. I want you to take one day and I want you to rest. No homework, no studying, no writing term papers. And I'm freaking out, right? At that moment, I'm going, I, I, okay, you're telling me, I'm wishing there was an eighth day of the week. You're taking a day away. Now there's six days. I can't do this. He says, just trust God for that seventh day. Give it to him. So Shane and I got together and we said, okay. I said, I want us to take the seventh day. I want us to rest. And in our, in our family at that moment, it was Sunday. So we said, okay, on Sunday, we're going to get up. We're going to go to church. We're going to serve. And so we served in the kids' ministry. 
That's where we serve that. They said, hey, we need, we need people in kids ministry. I said, hey, I love kids. Not really, but I'll do it. And so we jumped in and we started serving in kids ministry. Now I'm thinking to, my, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, there's no way. I, I, I mean, I don't have enough time. What do I got to do? But I said, God, I'm going to give this to you. So I'm, I'm going to worship you. And then I'm going to serve. And then I'm going to spend time with my wife. We're going to worship together. We're going to serve together. And then we're just going to spend time. No homework, no work. So I told my job, hey, I can't work anymore on Sundays. I said, well, we, 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 we have to have you in. I said, I can't. I said, okay, we'll give you a couple weeks. If your quota can stay up, at that time, I was selling cars. As I said, if your quota can continue to go on, and that's a big if, right? Because Saturday and Sunday are big car days. If you can keep up your quota, you can take Sunday off. I said, okay, I'm gonna take this time off. And so we did. And it changed my life. It changed my marriage. It changed me. So from that day forward, we just decided we don't have to do this. This isn't some legalistic do's or don'ts. This is how we refresh our souls. So then it got kind of crazy because then I became a pastor and I have to work on Saturdays and Sundays. Every single week, I got to write a term paper and I get a lot of really smart people, both online and in person, who critique my term paper that I then got to present every single week and critique me on social media and through emails and through everything else about how it was good or it was bad and they talk about it afterwards. And so all these things are happening. So there's a lot of pressure every single week, but I work on the weekends now. That's my full-time job. I work all through the week and then I also work on the weekends. So how do I do that? So what I decided is Thursday afternoon, later afternoon, I leave. And my Sabbath begins sundown on Thursday night to Friday at, at night. And I take Friday and I rest. I rest. And there's all the pressure that, what, 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 you know, you got these phone calls and you got all this, but I just, I rest. And it's changed me. In the middle of my week, before the work's ever done, because I still got a lot of work to do over here before the sermon's ever presented, before anything's done. Everything is kind of clamoring for attention. In that moment, I go, God, I want to be still and just rest. And it's revived me. And this is why I want to challenge you one day. So you say, well, what do I do in that one day? I want to just share some principles of what I do that helps me to rest. And it comes from the acronym REST. So R. Easy for you to remember, R. You refocus on what is important. What I do every Sabbath rest is I refocus on what is important. It allows me to recenter and go, okay, this is what I really care about in life. When you get busy, busyness has a way, and this is when you know you're being pushed and that the things you should care about, you no longer really care about. That's when you know you, you, you are getting into a problem area. And so every Sabbath I come on a rest day and I begin to say, okay, God, why is this important? And I go back to what is important. And so that means, you know what? I still have to parent. So you're going, I'm, I'm a mom. I'm a stay at home mom. I'm a single mom or I'm a single dad. I, does this mean like on the Sabbath rest, I can just say, okay, kids, get out of the house. You can't do that. What I do on the Sabbath is I go at a little slower speed and I remind myself why it's so important to be a dad in the first place. So I drive my little girl to school and I'm reminded this is what's important. This is what's essential to me. I come home and I love my wife. This is what's important to me. I'm reminding myself at the end of the day, this is who I want to be because this is who I am. This is what matters to my life. You need to take one day a week out where you refocus and you define what's important to you. Because if not, the world will. Your employer will. Social media will. Pressure will. 
But this is where you stand back and say, God, hold on, this is to you. I'm refocused on what is important. God, you are important to me. And so God, I'm coming back. So what's important? This is why my challenge would be to you, hey, serve on your Sabbath. Why? Because what's important to me? I love to serve. I, I love to give. These, these things are important. I'm reminded of what is crucial to my life. So I take that time. My encouragement to you is one day you do not do what occupies your mind and your energy for the previous six days. So if you're a painter, probably went paint on that seventh day. If you're a salesperson, don't try to close a deal on that day. If you're an executive, let everybody know it can wait one day. On that day, you're trusting. So you refocus on what is important. E, you enjoy what is life-giving. It says in Isaiah, it says that we are to rejoice and celebrate the Sabbath. It's not supposed to be a day where you just sit around going, okay, do nothing, do nothing, do nothing. No, no. It's what gives you life. What is life-giving? What do you really delight in? This is incredible. And God actually says, I want you to enjoy one day where you actually do what brings you life. So what is that for you? For, for me, it usually revolves something around outdoors. I love the outdoors. So it could be surfing, it could be the beach, it could be just, hey, I'm going for an hour walk. I'm going for a hike. It usually revolves around some form of food because Shane and I are foodies and we love to eat. So we usually have a big feast and we eat good food on Friday. It's what we do. We just do what is life-giving. We, we, we just laugh as a family. We laugh with each other. We hang out. We enjoy it. What brings you life? I don't know what that is. Maybe it's a quiet book. Maybe it's calling your friends. Maybe it's just getting away from your friends. I don't know. What is it for you? You know in your soul, God wired you differently, but you have to begin to discover, hey, this is what is life-giving to me. When I do this, I feel refreshed. What is that for you? Guard yourself that you don't become numb and you don't just seek things to occupy time, but you actually do things that bring you life. You have to be intentional. So what do you enjoy doing? Do it. Just have fun. Isn't it amazing our God is so good, he actually commands us to have fun? Celebrate, he says. Feast. Enjoy this day. So what is life-giving? S, seek God's presence. One day, I'm gonna, one day a week, I'm seeking God's presence. This is why it's great if your Sabbath, your day of rest is Saturday or Sunday, you can begin to push in and just say, okay, God, I'm going to worship with your people. I'm going to push in and begin to celebrate. God, I'm going to seek you. And so you come. And so I'm, I'm challenging you. This is why it's so important, especially on the weekends. If you can get in the rhythm of every single week saying, I know all these things are important. All these things are essential. But hey, I want to give some time every single week to seek the presence of God. Now, does that mean you have to be in church every single week? I'm, again, don't make this legalistic, Okay. But is it helpful every single week? Yes. It's important. It's important for you. It's important for your kids. It's important. Your kids need to know what is essential to you. And they know by what you do, not just what you say. And so we build our lives upon, hey, we're going to seek the presence of God. We're going to be still. And so we seek him. And so we worship. We sing praises to God, but it's incredible it's not just what you do for that, that two hours. You don't just come, okay, I'm going to serve. I'm going to worship. I'm going to do this. No, it, it's throughout the whole day. You're opening your ears to say, God, I want to see you. It's incredible because the Bible says, be still and know that God is God. There's only certain things you'll become aware of in stillness. Busyness has a way to force you to become only aware of what you can do. Stillness has the ability to make you aware of the things only God can do. And if you will take a, just a day, this day, God, give me eyes. I want to be more aware of your presence. And then when he speaks, you're just still for a moment. Thank you, God. 
Several times I, I just, I'm going throughout that day and God just says, he puts, he reminds me of his love. And I just, at that moment, I just stop. And I go, God, I thank you for your love. You've been so good to me. And I just begin to praise him. And, and I'm on the lookout. God, how can you use me? And I'm aware of people that are hurting. I become more aware how God is moving in people's lives when I'm still. In stillness, you become aware. Busyness crushes your spiritual hunger. It's in stillness it increases an appetite for the things of God. And so seek his presence. One day a week, God, I'm going to still do a lot of the things. I still have to take care of my kids. I have to still, you know, we have to cook. We have to clean. We have to do those things. Okay. But as I do it, show me how you're moving. And it changes you. It's a matter of perspective. If you will, sh if you begin to do this, it shapes you. It's powerful. And then T, trust God's got it. Because here's what's going to happen. It happens to me every week. Remember that person you said you were going to call and you didn't call? Yeah. You need to call them. Mm -hmm. Remember that person that they ticked you off? Yeah. What do you want to tell them? Oh, I'll tell them what I want to tell them. And I start going in my mind, all the complexities and all the issues. And in that moment, I got to purposely stop and go, no, 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 no. Shift my thinking. God, I trust you with this relationship. God, I trust you. Well, what, 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 you should have handled that, okay? But God, you can handle it for me today. The battle of the Christian faith is always in the context of your mind. And it's taking every thought captive and training it where to focus at. And it's incredible, just one day a week, if you can get into this rhythm, what would begin to happen is when those thoughts hit you, and they're going to come, Hey, there's another email. Who is it? There's work. You got to do it. If in that moment you go, hold on. God, I want to thank you that today you can handle that for me. Thank you. You're going to handle that. So I don't have to today. So I'm praising you that you can handle what I can't handle today. And God, I thank you that you can handle the things that I could handle if I would just start working. You got this, God. You got this. You got this. You got this, God. You got this. Well, how do you know? Because God didn't redeem you out of Egypt. God stepped in to our world and took on flesh. That's how much he cared for you. And he rescued you with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm that stood out on the cross that he died for you to let you know this is how much you are worth to me. I'm willing to die for you to take care of you. And then he died and they put him in the grave and they said it was done and he rose on the third day and he looks at you and says, hey, hey, hey. if I can do that, don't you think I can handle that? I got this. And one day a week, I go, okay, whoo. God, I'm reminded. You got this. And as that becomes a rhythm weekly, it starts becoming a rhythm daily. And it starts becoming a rhythm hourly. And it starts becoming the very essence of your life. That's what God wants for you. Will you pray with me right now? Will you just say, God, I thank you that I can rest, that my source of rest is in you. And so, God, I trust you right now. I trust you that you can handle this. And so, God, teach me to rest. God, help me to battle fear that I don't have to live in fear anymore, but I can rest because I trust that Jesus, if you love me enough to die for me and you love me enough to rise again for me and you love me enough to right now intercede on my behalf and work for my good, no matter the situation, that I'm going to rest in you. God, teach me to rest because I trust in you. So right now, will you just pray that to God? God, I trust in you 
Jesus, you are my Savior and my Lord. So because of what you shouted for me on the cross and what you declared over me through the resurrection, I am trusting in you. And so help me to rest. Thank you, God, that I don't have to do it all on my own, that you got this. And so help me one day, out of the week, teach me the rhythm of rest. Thank you, God. Amen.